should let you tell me, like I said yesterday, I will let you tell me what you want me to do. We have this in the data set that I sent you, the homework data. You can see over here, I think it's data for those of you who are not familiar. It's nice the way this sets up. You know, have these command, sort of history, recent history of commands, and then there's these variables here, right, you need to work with them. Here's your command line down here. You know, you can just take a look at the data, too. You can do this and give you a little bit of additional information. Well, not really here, but um, it would if it, if it had other information here together. But at any rate, you have a... Uh, what do we want to do? Let's start with variable one. What are we What are we wanting to do? Just what do we want to see? Do first with variable one. Yes. Yes, lot. Always visualize. So those of you who are used to cross-sectional data, which is probably I'm guessing most of you, uh, this is not the first thing you would do, right? When you would cross data. In fact, it might be the last thing you did, right? If you ever did it at all, right? Just look at your data. So here we are. So we do TS live, bar one. Okay. What do you see? Trend? Trend or do you think drift? Remember yesterday we drew this thing. So what's, what's the difference between trend and drift? Is the trend going constantly in one direction and the drift? comes back. Okay, that's right. So drift, what, how, what, what process produces drift? Is it a systematic process? Random. Randomness produces drift, right, exactly. Just flips of points, right? What produces trend? Something non-random. That's the best way to think about it. It's non-random, it's systematic, right? That's what, that's what it looks like we have here, right? It looks like we have some trend. Uh, some people would say, well, maybe it's a possibility you just have a really, really short Time series, right? That if you looked at it longer, it would, it would, this is a drift up, and if you looked at it longer, it would drift down. What would you say in response? Just looking at this. How do you know, or why do you think it's not just some very, very short, so, you know, you know? Let's say this is like these are like minute by minute readings of a you know, stock market or something like that. So you're really not getting much time at all, second by second, better yet. So obviously, thousand seconds. But what's a thousand seconds? It's nothing. Right? Or microseconds, even better yet. What would be your response based on this data? What's your hunch? Why? What you're guessing? You're saying that's not right, and I think you're right to think that. Well, it depends what kind of data you're looking at. So if there are milliseconds of the stock market, I would bet my life that it's not actually something that could change drastically for the next period of time. Does that look like a line, pretty much? Like a straight line? That's your, probably your first hunch, right? Now, does that mean we're definitely right? No, we're never definitely right. So that's, I mean, but it looks like a straight line, right? There's no wiggle or bend or anything to it, right? Your randomness is going to give you some wiggle or bend. There's a little bit, you can maybe tease out right now. Like, maybe this comes up, maybe this drops up a little bit. This is a very, very slice. <coughs> you know, you can't be sure, right? But what can we do to test it a little further, to poke at it a little further after we visualize that? What do you do next?
there's something going on in the parcels, it looks like, right, as well. You can't tell for sure. Uh, and the third thing you notice is to see the significance values. Like zero, 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 zero. This is clearly, clearly something's going on. So does, it, does that really surprise you, given that what we saw in the picture? No, this is, you, you thought something's going on. This really doesn't add a whole lot of information to that, does it? It does it to me. Um, you know, we may want to come back to this after we do some, you know, we model the variable and see what the residuals look like. So what's the possibility, so what, what do we, so far we think it, it looks like, it, but could you possibly say, what if somebody said, well, you know, this looks kind of like an integrated process?
So we have that now, we have the residuals. What do we do with those residuals? I'm just going to do, again, core ground, this is simple. At, at AC, I think at PAC are easy to, easier to see, but we're, we're just trying to do quick, quick and dirty here. What do we find? There's a lot of correlation going on here, right? Uh, it dies off, right? Is it geometric? Kind of, right? It's kind of, it's kind of not, it's not perfect with there. What does the partial tell you? Looks like it's just one, right? Just the, the current correlation. We can just take a better look. The AC is, as you know, PAC is to be a little bit better look at it. There you go, you have the one spike. All right, the rest of them are not significant. Just we can get T minus two, three, four. No, that's it. That's significant. Not much going on. You don't worry about little significance. I'm sorry, a little rabbit. Well, you worry a lot if you didn't have any. Because you ought to have one in, one in 20 you know, at the 5% uh, the level. That's right. And less than one in 20. That's right. <coughs> don't worry too much if it's less than one in 20. Worry if there's a lot, of, and there's a pattern. There's a pattern to your worry. But a pattern to look at it for partials are maybe two spikes, three spikes, something you know, early on in the sequence of spikes. So okay, so okay, so we uh, it looks like it's we've got a trend in this variable, and we detrend it. But it looks like we have something else going on, some systematic error. It looks like an auto regressive process maybe. So what do we do? Like what? Uh, the residuals. Uh, and do what with those slides? Like residuals. Regress the residuals on the That's one thing you can do, right? There's a nice procedure we worked with yesterday that does all this stuff kind of where you can. Arima, all right? You just tell Arima, it's our variable xxx, x, x, right? Uh, Arima, what do we want to model? <coughs> Sorry? What do we want to do? Model this? One over one. One over one. Sorry, okay. One, one zero zero. Um, what do we get? There we get uh, auto regressive parameter 0.47. Uh, Z of about 17. Right. Very, very significant. What do we want to do now? So it looks like we have an auto regressive process here. What do we want to do next? Yeah. And then four gram again. And we have nothing. <coughs> right? Nothing here, nothing here, nothing significant. Well, you can find a little bit of something going on here, but you know, don't worry about much about this. So, what do we conclude? What's this variable? What is variable one? It's a combination of a trending, a trending variable, and an autoregressive process with a parameter of about 0.5. Right? That's kind of a nice. This is not uncommon. You're going to find these kinds of series in life quite a bit. So I think about the times trend. And they often times trend for reasons that are completely unrelated to your X variables. Uh, it's unobserved, um, maybe at least unmodeled. Um, observed and unmodeled. From your point of view, they're both, in effect, unobserved, right? It's the model that matters. So that's your variable one. That's good. So everybody follow that pretty, that's pretty straightforward, right? It's a pretty easy one to, 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 um, to diagnose. It's a pretty straightforward variable. What about variable two? Any questions on that? Do you have any questions yet? Oh, well, variable two. That's good. Any, any questions on variable one? Move on? Okay. Yeah, Jessica. Why do you do predictions that are just not normally distributed uh, in a way that's, um, well, in a way that's non monotonal? Like a bimodal, for example. Uh, what do you, when shocks are that one? Or when? Well, when some of the predictor, well, let, let us say the variable was like that. 
is bimodal. What is bimodal? It's distribution. Um, I don't know when you, it's hard to, I don't see that happening. In the well, part two is bimodal. Ah, okay, good, okay, okay. let's just, yeah, let's proceed, get, 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 get out of the model. Okay. What, what is, what is, what is, uh, just, what is distributed by model? Um, just the variable that starts with UK density, yet, for example. Yeah. Okay, yeah, let's come back to that after we go okay. through the model. How do you approach modeling? What is the first thing you do? It's time series. So it's TS1 and Yep. Var 2. And what's it look like? That's it. What do you think is going on here?
at looking at one year, you're looking at what little spot in time, a little, you know, week, you know. Uh, and, and, and we can say, well, what do you do, Tommy? Tell us about that week. And, and we're asking different questions. We're talking about change as opposed to levels. You know, there's different kinds of issues. But so you know, you know, and, and can tell you a lot about uh, about the world if it covers enough time. You know, like Fifty cases can tell you about. Them. So what? Okay. So what do we do? So you look at this. You think it's integrated. Most of you. Maybe there's a trend possibility. We can test that if we want. So what would we do next? So what did you do next, Nina and, and, and Katrina? You 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 arrived at some specification, but you must have you must have done something. Did you just jump right into a Rima? Uh, no, we did, we did what we did before. We did the AC, the PAC, okay. the choreograms. AC, what are we working with here? Bar two. <coughs> What's that look like? <laughs> stationary or non-stationary?
an approximation p value for the zt? Is it significant or not? What does that tell you? You cannot say that there's not a unit root. So that's what that's what that tells you. Right. Right. If this is if there's a unit root, then what's the coefficient going to be? Zero. What is the coefficient? It's zero. Can we reject the hypothesis that the null that's zero? No. Can we even come close to it? No. Okay. So it's consistent. There's a non-stationary process. Looks like there's an integrated process in here. But uh, there's a little thing. There's a little something here you're going to want to also do. You saw, remember those trace little uh, partial autocorrelations you saw? Right? You saw that? Uh, remember, you're we we worried about trend maybe? Put in the trend variable. What do you see? There's trend there, right? Maybe there is trend. Right? See so the trend here, you put it in, just put, you know, regress trend, put the trend variable in. It's significant, right? What happens to our test statistic? Oh, all of a sudden now we're in the land of uh, rejecting the null hypothesis, right? But remember there's something else you can do here. Remember the augmented Dickey Fuller test we talked about? The log augmented Dickey Fuller test involves you adding in these lag difference variables. So you've got the difference variable, right? The difference your variable to regress on your lag level variable, right? And then you have an out regress because we specified lag spot in addition to the trend, right? You can put a trend variable in there. Now it's borderline. You know, things will drop in a moment. So we put in these lag difference marks, lag, second lag, third, fourth, fifth, we specified five lags. So you can do more. I knew if you specify the lag when you're doing this, you're trying to specify, what you're trying to pick up is other residual, <coughs> other stuff going on. Right? And as you saw that there's these partials, remember you saw the partials? Two lag, two lag, two, three, lag, four, lag, five. <coughs> so what do we do? We put in five lags here, even though we only need the four because we have the lag level. And what do we find? Four of them are significant. One, two, three, four, right? Fifth one drops out. How many, how many lags do you decide to include? I don't want to go too far into this, but you know what you do is you sort of pick a number, like here, pick five, which seems reasonable. If you then add it, go to 10, and you see what your significance cutoff is. It will, you know, it's significant through 10, well, it'll stop at five. You go back down to six, you have six comes up, you try four. You basically, you just, you just try on error, right? You're basically doing some kind of your own sort of mental copper or cut, right, type procedure to find out where, where, where you draw the line. And here, here it turns out to be four or five. Notice, when you put these back in, what happens to the test statistic? It becomes even, even more confident than it's a unit root. I mean, some people say you shouldn't read p values that way, but why not? It's information, right? Um, you can drop the trend to see what that does. Now you're basically sure that there's a unit root process. But you're also sure there's something else going on. <clears throat> this is precisely what you're going to find. Let's go see here. So we could, we could go model. We could go model um, this variable using a REMA. And I'm sorry, I'm moving ahead of you a little bit because we just don't want to spend the whole morning on this. Um, just bear with me. And if you have any questions, please stop me. So you're going to want to model this with a REMA. The question you're trying to figure out what's going on with these other What's this other process like? What's, what's the story on this other process? Um, it's not that easy to disentangle. So if you do it with a REMA, though, you can go in and tell it. So in this case, you think what? Well, you think it's, it's, a, it's got a 0, 1, 0 component to it, right? You don't know if whether it has an autoregressive or moving average component. So one possibility is to model it like this. 1, 1, 1. Right? So one autoregressive, right? So estimated autoregressive parameter, and one of integration, which means difference to the variable before you do that. And then three, one moving average parameter. Really good starting point. And what comes up? It's differenced, has a positive autoregressive parameter, it has a negative moving average parameter. Both are significant. What is this? This is actually a pretty telltale sign of a combined process where you have 
an integrated component and an autoregressive component. The difference variable, if you take half, then that's exactly what this series is. It's half integrated and half autoregressive. It's a combined process. Some shocks, remember yesterday I showed you, were some shocks, you could have a variable where some shocks last and some shocks decay. This is precisely that series. Half the shocks last and half the shocks decay. And I, I can't walk you through all the math of this because it's actually kind of tricky. But you know, you get this, this, this process where you get a shock and you get back. Another shock over here. So you're, you're always, something with half of this last, they can have this decay. So at each point in time, you know, you get, you know, at the end of time, at time two, right, you have your shock ET, plus you have half of the shock times ET minus one, the plus, right, because half of it persists. And then what about the other half of the shock? Some portion of it still carries forward, right, depending on your autoregressive parameter. So if that's 0.8, say, let's say it's 0.5, well, 0.8 is 5. So if it's 0.8, then you have plus 0.4 ET minus one. The next point in time, what's left? Right. Well, you get a, you know, of course, you get a new shot here, right? <coughs> you get a portion of this one, right? Half of that one. That still comes forward, but only 80% of that carries forward. And so on. So if you have this process where this decay is not more regressive, right? And the shock's because it's, 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 in, order, in order to model it, you need to model it with a moderate regressive and moving the average components together. Because the, the, K, the decay is, it goes from 0.9 right, to 0.82, right? So it's this decay that's, that's, that it's, this, it's, it's a non-geometric decay. And so you can't model it just using an autoregressive process. You can try to model it actually using multiple moving average processes. If you want, if you, the best alternative specification to 111 is um, 0, 1, 5. So you difference, then you get, you get the, the other, uh, moving average components. And how do you decide which one of those is correct? Well, this process predicts both of those. And that's a really neat thing. What you do know is something's coming and lasting, and something's coming and not lasting. And there's a, it's, it's hard to fully parameterize it. I'm not going to try to walk you through all this. If you're interested in this, this is not easy to get online. This is not, this is, you have a really difficult time finding this online. This is the kind of series I think you're most likely to deal with, whether you're working with individual level data, whether you're working with macro level data, or something, you know, sort of something in between, whatever that means. And the, the, you're, you're, you're mostly, you're gonna, and most often, you expect things, some things to last and some things to decay. If nothing else, you're going to expect things maybe measurement error to decay, but you also expect substantively some things to decay. We talked about advertising. Maybe some ad effects last. Some that effects decay. Maybe when we combine them, we make it really hard for, you know, to find the, the effects that, 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 that last. Because what swamps us are the effects that decay. Partly maybe due to the measurement error itself. Okay, so this is, if you want more math on this, let me know. I'll send it to you. And, but this is, you know, we could check it out and we'll see, we'll see how our residuals look. Predict. <coughs> How's it look? Perfect, right? Nothing going on. Okay, so that's that's variable two. Is that pretty straightforward? I don't expect this to be absolutely crystal clear like you walk out of here and you feel like you, you know. Mike was pointing out why the partial correlations are an indicator of uh, well, because you have something residual after you difference it, you have the residual. And this is right, the difference. What you're saying, this is the, this is where it gets tricky. I mean, when you're differencing, you, you're not different. You don't have left. It doesn't leave over on a regressive process because you, these shocks are not decaying, right? It, it, you've got here. You've got et plus 0.5 et minus one, okay? Plus 0.4 et minus one. So that gives you et plus 0.9 et minus one, right? Of this ET minus one, at the next point in time, you're still going to have the 0.5 carry forward, right? So then you're going to have 0.8 times 0.4. So it's going to be 0.9, that becomes 0.82, right? And then it becomes 
you know, 0.75. And see the decay, 0 0.9, 0 0.82, 0 0.75. That's not geometric. Right? So that can't be modeled with an AR parameter. It has to be modeled with a combination of an AR parameter and an NA A parameter, or just an A parameter. You can say, well, what's the difference between the two? Well, if you run a test on what's the better specification, you're going to find out it's the one 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 test. The ESTAT test can tell you that. But also, more importantly, it, it's exactly what you would predict if you have a combined <coughs> autoregressive process and a spin integrated process. What, is that the, what's the more likely story? If you've got an autoregressive process combined with an integrated process, or you've got a moving average four process, five process with an integrated process? Most of you are going to say, I think it's, you know, it, it, make, it looks like an autoregressive process. Why? Because those auto -cor partial autocorrelations don't just, be, it's not like they bounce around completely randomly, like they're, they're higher and they kind of drop down, right? So they're going to be spiky, but you've got random stuff in there too. Which, that's what's going down, right? They're not going down and then up, right? And they're just zeroing out. A lot of it's going to depend on theory. A lot of it's going to depend on the pattern you feel. The point that I wanted to make, though, is that if you have partial autocorrelation going several points in the past, this is a dead giveaway that you have a moving average process. Because a perfect moving average process, the partials are constant. Here you've got at least the first few are, are, are up there. Which, which gives you a very strong hint that there's a moving average in there. Right, and the moving average is a result of what? In this case, it's the result of an autoregressive process. Right. Added together with an integrated process, and then you difference, and what are you doing? You're differencing out, you're differencing out this autoregressive process, right? <laughs> which is in there, which is basically over difference. So it creates partial autocorrelation. That's, that's much more than we want to get into. Um, we have time series cross section stuff to get to. So real quickly, we're going to go now to variable three. What does that look like? It's a little bit different. Huh? It's a little bit different than the other ones. Why? I cut it off, right? I only give you 100 time points. <coughs> TS line doesn't show you as much as a result. So what do we want to do? TS line variable three if yeah. x is less than 101. Yeah. What's it look like? Harder to tell, isn't it? This is a process that was, you know, it took, a, you know, generated the process, but it's only now over a hundred points, or instead of over a thousand points. What's the, um, what's the story here? What do you think it is? Yeah. <coughs> so you think it's an integrated process? Stationary process? So what would you do next? So what do we 
do next? Somebody say something. We can spend all morning on this. What do we do next? Why would we want to look at the time? Do you think it's a trending variable? No. So we don't want to do that. So what would we want to do? Good. You follow as an option, right? Regress again. What do we find? Well, P is 0.12, it doesn't look like we can regress, but that's not the only way we've got other stuff we can include, like trend, with, we have a possibility of trend. You know, we can always consider the possibility there's a trend, no. Nope. You consider lag differences, right, the augmented that you pull Lag is put in three, we only have 100 cases or so, right, what do we find? Looks like there's a, nothing going on there, right? So it looks like we are, it looks like we have some kind of unit root process, right? Possibly. Uh, so we can model it, right? So what are we going to do? Arima. Oh, we could do Arima, or else we could do a simple way. What's the simplest way? We do this. Yeah, pretty good. <coughs> do it ourselves, right? Difference, difference bar three, right? So we're basically doing the same thing as Arima. But why do Arima predict residuals, right? When all you need to do is just difference the variable yourself, right? So we difference it ourselves. What do we get? It's all gone, right? There's no autocorrelation, there's no partial autocorrelation, so we can prove that it's a, a unit root process. So then why do we get this, these uh, autocorrelations that we get? Why don't we get, where is it? Why don't we get the nice, flat autocorrelation function? Why is it set up there at 0 0.99, 0 0.98, 0 0.97, 0 0.99, 0 0.98? It tells to be in the first figure we looked at. What was the first figure we looked at? What did it show? We only have 100 time points, right? We cut it off. So why did Chris cut it off? This is an integrated process. If you saw it over a thousand time points, the evidence would have been as plain as day to you. It would have been just exactly what this is the exact same variable we worked with last yesterday in classroom, the Q variable, the integrated variable. This is precisely the same variable. It's just over 100 time points instead of 100 over 1,000 or 10. It takes time for things to drift down low and then sit there for a while, right? You correlate, remember you're correlating high with high. So the further it goes up high, the further it goes down low, which takes time, the higher the correlations get, right? Because high, 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 low, 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 low right? Now you're trying to create a lot of correlations when it's still pretty close to the middle, right? After 200, it's going to be drifting down here or up there, right? After 300, it'll be drifting down here and up there, right? And so you're going to be coral under correlating minus 50s with minus 49s with minus 52s, right? Not minus 2s with minus 1s with minus 3s, right? So you're getting more spread, you're getting more possibility for the autocorrelation function to manifest the integrated process. Probably, the reason why this is important the reason is that we're living in finite time, right? We're working with finite time. We don't have huge data sets that encompass full time, and it makes it a lot harder. And so what you're looking for when you're looking for integrated processes, and most of the data that you're going to find is you're not going to be looking for those nice archetypal flat point nine nine nines. You're looking for maybe a point nine, point nine, point eight, point seven five, point seven two, point six three. That's not geometric to kind of key, right? It's linear. It's not geometric. What does that tell you? Maybe it's a finite time realization of a, which is a long run integrated process. It's this linearity of it as opposed to the geometric uh, decay that that really tells you. Any questions on this stuff? Should be. These last two points are something we're going to come back to a little bit in class today because I want to work with you on finite with finite time. I mean, I want to emphasize that. But the, um, we'll show you. We'll, Work on that a little bit. Any questions on this stuff before we, we're running pretty deep already in the session? Uh, we're probably going to go till right until 11, okay? And then we'll take our break and we'll come back. We'll probably go straight till lunchtime this morning, okay? And then 
this was afternoon session, I'll cut off a little early so we can get everything done. Uh, no homework tonight. Okay, so just. Uh, I think I'll be chasing you at the airport. Uh, okay, so here we are. Um, recall what we were the last time we were talking about identification, we were talking about auto regression and moving average. These are stationary processes. I just want to why do you keep talking about this? I want you to really get a little repetition is, you know, what studying is all about. What studying is all about repetition, right? Go over again and again and again. Or repeating again and again. Remember they're covariance stationary as well. Integration, right? Non-stationary. You did a really good job, I think, on that. So thanks for putting in the time, particularly those of you who really invested. Uh, it'll pay dividends for you. If you have any questions, by the way, if you have an alternative specification, I don't want to get into too much. No, we had exactly the same. We had every material one zero, so different. But then we called the spikes to not look uh, random, and then we tried to model seasonality, and we had the number one. Good, that's really good. I mean, that's something that didn't work out, right? Which is good. It's not there. <laughs> It's not, yeah. I'll tell you what, I break, let's talk. Okay, that's uh because uh, I I I am just realizing as we're going ahead that you put in so much effort, I hate that I think I would like you should you should get paid off, so let's talk. We'll talk talk a break out of coffee. Okay, um Okay. Okay, integration, remember this is this is all just re repeating what we did last time. Um, one thing that we can try to do is this is sort of what we were doing here after we've done diagnosis of AR or MA or, or integrated, and most of the time we're gonna be trying to diagnose um, you try looking, looking to, to differentiate between AR and uh, integration. Um, sometimes I may. Uh, and then you try to also reduce, also the, you know, deal with these alternative hypotheses, right? Like AR2 and MA2, and the like. Um, possibly an I2, I guess Nina and Katrina we're dealing with, which is, uh, which is interesting. Um, and uh, and that, that's called that meta diagnosis, right? And that's sort of some of the stuff that we talked about already. There's some, there's some statistical tests that help you uh, sort through those kinds of things. Judgment is also a large part of it. So the time series, particularly when you're dealing with finite time, is, you know, is, judgment is a lot of it. Okay. Here, combined processes, these are something we did, we, we barely introduced yesterday. We've already looked at a case of combined process, right? Uh, and this is when you take an integrated series and you add it in an autoregressive or MA. This is seemingly really, really quite common. Bob Erickson and I are working on election campaigns in the United States. Both at the individual and the aggregate level see it as a combined process where some things hit people and cause them to move and they last forever. Uh, some, and some of the things that cause people to move don't. So it's a combined process of lasting effects and temporary effects. I mean, isn't that what you theorize about a lot? I mean, isn't that your intuition about a lot of the world? Not everything lasts, but not everything decays, right? In the old days, they used to assume everything decays, which is really kind of funny. And remember when the econometricians were assuming stationarity? I mean, would you, I mean, do you actually really believe that everything decays? Nothing lasts. Nothing stands in test of time. Okay. Well, if you do believe that something stands in test of time, uh, my guess is that you definitely believe that some things don't stand in test of time, so you're going to be in the land of combining processes. And the example of that variable that I had given you was this 0.5 cum here plus 0.5 error red. So that cumulative integrated variable and integrated uh, autoregressive process uh, and put the two together. This is one where you have an autoregressive parameter of 0.8, the one that we were with in class in our last <coughs> I believe, of 0.5. Okay. We've already done some of this, so I'm not going to go through all of that. Done this as well. This is giving us this uh, Nikki Polar test. Okay, this is what we also did. I had to look at number. The third variable. This, uh, well, similar to this, the third variable actually was a cumulative variable. What I want to show you now is what happens when you take a combined variable and look at it. Uh, what was the variable we worked with in class? I think it was my combined two variable. And uh, what we're going to do here is do TS line F. That's what it looks like when you're, this is a combined unit root and autoregressive process over 10,000 cases of points, right? Now let's take it and look at it over 100.
What's that look like? Quite a bit different, doesn't it? What if you just ignore the first half of the series? So you had 50 observations. I consider that a lot of time series. What is that look like? In fact, you would probably have gotten money if that's stationary process. Is it stationary? No. It has a unit root in it, right? It has a stationary process in it too, but it has a unit root in it. It doesn't look like it, though, does it? This is the kind of world that we live in. Right? This is the kind of world, this is where we have to diagnosis. I mean, we may not even have 50, we may have 30. The really nice thing, the nice thing about unit root processes is in theory, when you put a unit root process together with an auto stationary process, in theory, you will find the unit root process, but it only is, is easy to find in the long run, depending also on the size of the component. I mean, if you take a you know, one thousandth of a unit root process and add it together with 999 autoregressive, it's going to be hard to find. It. Let's say you have 50-50 you know, or some reasonable combination where you might expect to find it. You know, or even 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 smaller. If you find over long periods of time, you're gonna find it. You'll, even in long periods of time, you'll find the one one thousand. Right? You've got a million observations. It will find. You will find it. The problem is that we're dealing in finite time, and finite time is really hard to uncover that unit root process. And it's part of what I was talking about is you don't have time for the series of drift, right? So to get away from the zero point, from the starting point. And that's gonna. That's what gives you the evidence, right? Both in the pictures and the autocorrelations, right? That you uh, that you have something that's lasting forever that's indefinite. And if you tell here, I mean, this, this is really really trippy to tell, right? Visually, what kinds of things do we want to do? We just do the same sorts of things we've done before. Right? Two. Again, now working with x is less than one on one. So we find looks like something. Something's going on. It looks a little more geometric though, doesn't it? What would be your guess here? You look at the picture, it looks pretty stationary. You look at the correlations, it looks pretty stationary. Right? It might infer stationarity. You might do a Dickey Fuller test. In fact, we probably don't want to do programs. Probably want to limit the program because we only have 100 cases, right? So we can count. Pretty stationary looking, isn't it? Pretty autoregressive. We might do a Dickey Fuller test. Kind of to do it less than 101, to regress. What do we do? We regress the null, right? It's stationary, so we find. Maybe we should put the trend in there, see if that helps. Help. doesn't help. How about lags? No, no help for the lags. So what do we conclude? Stationary process. Are we right? No. What can you do about it? Not a whole lot. You can try to model. Remember the trend component? If you can find a trend component, right? You have to find a unit root component. You can have a variable that's a unit root component, right? That you would think is explaining this, right? That you, you, could, you could incorporate that into your model. But firing that, firing some you know, process, way of actually modeling the process. If you're just looking at the, at the diagnostics, you're going to have a hard time convincing a journal editor after going through all this and journal reviewers that you actually have uh, a combined process or any integration going on at all. Here, nothing is standing the test of time. It's all the okay. Every piece of evidence you have shows that, but it's not true. It's all wrong. If you did 50 cases, it might even be harder. And I just picked the first 101 cases. If I haven't done it, it might be, you know, we could do the same thing with 50, 30. It's harder to do 50, 30, 20. Because again, because it takes the, the series need to drift away, you know, kind of hover up here for a while, hover down here for a while. Once it gets up there, it's going to stay up there, just because the shocks it takes a lot of shocks to bring it back down. Right? You got to flip heads a bunch of times to get it back down, or tails to get it back up, and that gives you a lot of correlations. Right? It's right there, down here, it's away from zero. Okay, that happy news? No. Oh. Uh, it's something you need to know. Mark, did you want to chime in on this at all? No. 
And I, I like to mean that it, sometimes you don't have a super solution for it. Right. I mean, the world, the world is, is, is some unkind place. I was talking to somebody yesterday. <laughs> um, you know, I think in general, in the social sciences, we have been unbelievably lucky. Our, our um, methods are really um, rough. Our data is horrible. But somehow, we seem to make progress even so. Um, and you, know, you can get stuck with something like this. Um, you, you, you don't know what the process is because you don't have enough time points. But you know, we will make progress anyway. You will publish something which in 50 years somebody will discover was wrong, but that's science. All right. So you're going to be wrong. So, um, <laughs> uh, to, it's, it's nice being right for a while, though. Um, especially, the, uh, especially good to be right when you're starting out. Ten year time. It's good to By the time you've had 40 years in the business, you can afford a few mistakes. <laughs> See, just like you can misdiagnose, in this case, you're, you're misdiagnosing, you're not, you're not finding persistence, which is really, really important. You could also, this is actually quite common. In my work on thermostatics life cycle, it's not uncommon for those relative, those relative preference variables to look unit root, even though they can't, they can't be. Right. If, they're, if, they're, if they're a linear combination of two integrated processes, right, like your underlying preferred level, which is integrated, and policy, budget policy, which is integrated, what is a linear combination of two integrated variables? <laughs> Stay sure. So we have a, you, know, you can't have that, right? Um, but these statistical tests sometimes don't show it. Right? So the example we're going to be working with in a bit is, the, is, our, is our European preference data. It's hard to reject the unit root hypothesis. Although we think that those data have to be stationary, right? So, uh, and there's more on this kind of stuff, this combined process stuff. I wrote this piece, it's now an old piece. Electoral studies about 12 years ago um, on how you deal with combined process. There's a lot of counterintuitive stuff in there. So if you're interested in that kind of thing and what to do about it, that's you know that's about as much as been has been done on it in political science at least. Um, you know, not that it's been taken terribly seriously. People just don't haven't really thought about this very much. Um, and don't do much with it. I, I I I do like to push you to do it though because I think. It's the one that makes the most sense. I think more often than not, we're going to find combined processes. Um, okay, remember that. This is just going through. Um, okay. Identification, remember, we talked about how determining whether something's stationary or non stationary is really important when it comes to modeling um, because. You, know, you can't just regress non-stationary data on non-stationary data. Okay. So what if you have stationary data? We're gonna, today we're, now we're going to spend some time working with auto-regressive auto, uh, auto distributed lag models and error correction models. And first we're going to start off with uh, stationary data. It's going to take a little bit of work on your part. It's not terribly hard, but it does make your, need your attention. But we're going to start with, with, the, uh, with the ADL, and we're going to turn to the ECM looking at non-stationary data, and then I'm going to show you the ECM with stationary data. Now, if you use, remember the ECM is created for non-stationary data, right? Yeah, but it's also can be applied, it's mathematically equivalent to the ABL, and so it can be applied to <coughs> data as well. Mark's our, recommendation is, I think, always to use ECM. And I think that what you'll know, see is that you may want to start in some cases with the station with ADL because it's more straightforward, and the ECM is hard to identify what's going on in the process as readily. But if you think data is non-stationary, you want to go with, or, or you conclude it's non-stationary, go, go with the ECM for sure. Because you can model those equilibrium errors in an equilibrium. <coughs> in a sense, you can't go wrong with an ECM. Because the ECM works whether it's stationary or non-stationary. The trouble with the ECM is interpreting the coefficients. And then, this is going to talk about that. Correct. OK. So remember the ADL. Now, remember yesterday, uh, in an ADL 1 1, you have you know, auto regressive lag 1, right? That's where the 1 1 comes from, 1 with the first one. And the second one comes from a lag x. And to make the ADL really, really useful, if, the, uh, yeah, if x is exogenous, you could put x sub t. If x, you're not sure x, x sub t is exogenous, then it could be x t minus 1 and x t minus 2. And it gives you pretty much the same thing. It's a little bit trickier. Most of you are working in a lab. Time series, at least, where we can, I'm just going to assume we can just, just uh, for, for this purpose, at least have XTB exogenous. 
Um, and so you have one lag on your x, which is the second one, and one lag on your y, which is the first one. Okay? Uh, and that, that indicates the order of the model, so this is about um, Okay, these kind of models can be estimated with OLS, but you always need to the reason it's all about the residuals, right? That's the one great thing that Arima has left us. Right? It's a phobia, an obsession on residuals. Okay, so let's just always go back and look at your Always go back and look at your residuals. It's another great thing about time series. Could you imagine doing that with an individual level that every reason? It's not easy, right? It's easy to look at them, it's not easy to make sense. Yeah, okay. it's, yeah. It's garbage. Right? It's, it's, it looks like Okay, so the ADL is a really, really good general modeling. <coughs> so just remember this equation. Keep this in mind. Put that here. Lag y, current x, lag x. Okay. Okay. Why? What do I? Why do I say it's a really good general modeling approach? Okay. Well, what if this is the real universe? The real universe is y sub t uh, is a function of x sub t. There's no y t minus one effect. Right, and no x <coughs> this one. How does the ADL help you find that? Well, it's pretty simple. If phi, which is the coefficient on lag y, is zero, then the y drops out, right? And if beta one, which is the coefficient on x t minus one, is zero, the x t minus one drops out. So what are you left with? X to t, right? So y equals, you know, beta naught x to t. So you estimate the ADL, and you get a zero coefficient for the lag with this variable, and you get a, 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 a zero coefficient for the lag with this variable. So what's the effect? It's current. Right? It's a static regression. Why is it static? There's no lags, right? In order for something to be dynamic, it has to have lags in it, right? What about a difference model? A lot of people like to do difference thing, right? This was the big Arima thing, right? Difference, difference, difference away, right? What if that's the right model? What are you going to find? There. That's going to uh, be apparent when the coefficient on when the coefficient on y is one, right? And that way you can subtract y from both sides, right? So it's y t minus y t minus one, y t minus one, minus y t minus one, so you get a difference of y t, right? And these coefficients are equal size and opposite sign, right? Right, because then you have, say, two times x of t minus two times x of t minus <coughs> one, so what is that? Two times the difference in x of t, right? So what is the difference in x of t? x of t minus x t minus 1, right? That's pretty straightforward algebra, right? We don't need to, we need to show you that. Okay, y t equals y t minus 1, because here t goes to 1, right? And then d not equals minus d1, right? So equal and opposite size, sign size, but different coefficients. So what does that mean? Plus p not x t minus p not right same thing x t minus one right so what is that equal? Track out y t minus one. Difference y t means drop out plus p not minus p not right times x t right. Partial adjustment model. You might think, okay, what is this all about? Why is he 
what do you want to do? Well, this is actually a really common model. Remember the kind of stuff we were doing yesterday? Y is a function of y2 minus 1 plus x and t, right? This is known as the lag dependent variable model. The whole difference between this and the ADL, the LDB and the ADL, if I think it's trivial, is the left missing xt minus 1. This is a very, very common model. I mean, what's common in the econometric work? Well, yeah, we find some uh, we find some serial correlations, so what are we gonna do? We y on x, let's just put a lag y. So get up, right? Put a lag y. Okay. It's not enough common, right? But that might be the right model. That might be the right model theoretically, both from the point of view dealing with all our correlations, but also dealing with the effect of you know, x and y, right? But here it changes in y decline as y tends towards asymptote. Remember we talked about the asymptote. Did we talk about the asymptote? Yeah, we talked about equilibrium. Remind us what the asymptote is. Well what is it here? I don't know what it means. What, is that? what does the word mean? That's what tells me it's where the variable heads, right? What's its equilibrium? Okay. It's right there, right? The coefficient, right? You not over 1 minus t. Remember this from yesterday? Remember we walked through this? I don't, you know, we could go through it again if you want. Uh, no, it's just a matter of knowing what the word means because you didn't use the word. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot. That's the, the equilibrium when it's when it's at its equilibrium, right? This is the equilibrium. So if you take this, if y at t minus if y today is this, then y tomorrow will be this plus the shock. That's it. There'll be no decay. If y is not this, then you'll expect decay, right? If it's above that, what happens? It decays to that. If it's below that, it decays up. It depends how much does it decay, right? How quickly does it decay? It depends on the speed, right? If that fee is big, then it decays slowly. If the fee is small, then it decays quickly, right? That just gives you the persistence parameter, right? 0.9 is a slow decaying process, right? 0 0.9, 0 0.81, 0 0.72, and so on. If it's 0.2, it's quick, right? 0 0.2, 0 0.04, right? Very quickly you're, you're done, right? Okay, that's for the lag dependent variable model, right? Now, if you add in, if the model is that that's actually not the right model, and it's actually that xt and xt minus 1 both have effects, right here, then the equilibrium is not this, it's the coefficient of sum of the two x coefficients, v0 plus v1. And that makes sense too, right? It's very simple to calculate. All you have to do is just Take a little piece of paper and you plug in values, and you'll see that the equilibrium is exactly how it works out. Of course, it may be that the coefficient for xt is called the zero up here. So it's not either a lag dependent variable model, so you don't have this. Right? It's not this ADL, but it's also you know, it might be this. It might be that you don't have anything, you don't have anything at x sub t. You just have the xt minus one. Right? And that's what you would sort of how you might model things if you thought xt was. Um, uh, potentially not exogenous. And if that's the case, right, it would be V0 is 0. It's pretty simple, right? Just run the model of V0 is 0. And this would tend towards V1 over 1 minus V. So, you know, if it's, if it's XT, it's that. If it's XT and XT minus 1, it's that. And if it's just XT minus 1, it's that. It's just different equilibrium. There are a whole variety of other models that we could show you. There's the, um, you, know, you may be familiar with like distributed lag models, where you're lagging x is xt, xt minus 1, xt minus 2, xt minus 3 with no y's. There's a coit model, which is an exponential distributed lag model. There's a finite distributed lag, both of which are really quite common. I could show you those. Uh, the whole point of this, though, is that there's a whole bunch of different models. This is a little trick you're showing me the quite. In fact, Mark saw it and just said, I, I got no show them that. Um, so, I'm not. I'm just telling you I could show you that. There's other things I could show you too. The point is that there are a whole variety of models relating X and Y. And what do we typically do as political scientists? We just pick one. We say, oh yeah, it's a difference model. Or it's a static model. Or it's, a, you know, a lag kind of variable model. Or it's an ADL model. Or it's a finite distributed lag model. Or it's an exponential distributed lag model. We're doing all, we're picking and choosing just based on our assumptions. But we don't need to do that. You can run this ADL, and it will, you know, it'll settle. It's good to have an idea of what we think, but you know, we're in the business of testing, right? Not, in the old days, they would just settle it by assumption. 
Uh, nowadays, you know, if you're going to test it, why not test it, right? So let's do test this. This shows you a really neat, easy way to do it. Yeah. Okay, for instance, our theory explains what variable should be for this one and which, at which time point. And then can we choose a, a model which we think is more appropriate? Can a model be more appropriate than another? Well, if you're right, what will the ADL show? The ADL will show you're right, right? Why, you know? Now, it's not a perfect tool, just like anything, right? The statistics are limited, and time series statistics are, you know, um, are limited. Um, and they can't perfectly tell you. But, you know, if you find a different model, if it, you know, statistically significant differences appear to applying a different model, then you should confront that, right? But we, the funny thing is, we most of us don't do this. Most of us don't. You know, almost nobody does this. But they go with the model they think is right. Put in a live dependent variable, it soaks up the other correlation. Yeah. <laughs> Just run with it. And, and it's still possible to publish on that basis because the reviewers are us. So you know, we we apply the contemporary standards. But don't be surprised if over the course of even the next five years the contemporary standards move forward. And all of a sudden you need models that he hasn't presented today because the reviewers are not letting you get through unless you check to make sure that it's not one of those. At that point you have to start reading Kennedy. Um, you know, or, or some other source. Kennedy's dead, so there won't be a seventh edition of Kennedy, unfortunately. Yeah, terrible. I don't know what we're going to do. Well, hey, I'm, I'm okay. If you guys are going to have a problem, you're going to have to find somebody else who can write in English about econometrics, which there's only been one person able to do that in the history of econometrics, and he didn't <laughs> die. Um, so, you know, hopefully somebody else will come along. Uh, but otherwise, you're going to have to learn math as well. Maybe one of you. Right. Um, but for the moment, for the next five years, Kennedy will still give you the things that Chris was just referring to, which you might find you start to need to know as the years go by. Right now, you get away fine without. The ADL, really the nice thing about the ADL, if you notice things spill out real easily, right? You, know, you don't have to do any sort of algebra after you do the coefficients to spill out, right? This coefficient zero, this one, one, the opposite. Very, very easy. <clears throat> so it's really, really useful as a diagnostic flow. It's worth just running, and it's you know, not, not that difficult to do. Uh, the other, now that's, 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 that's what you have uh, when you have uh, stationary data. When you have non stationary data, the way recommended approaches we've already discussed yesterday is the error correction model. Here it is again. Right. And here we have changes in y as a function of changes in x, right? Current changes. And uh, then this error correction component, y2 minus 1 and x2 minus 1. Which is an error, error correction component. Um, you notice that they're the same variables I pointed this out yesterday. You know, on the right hand side you have xt, xt minus 1, and y2 minus 1. Right? So you have them. They're in a different kind of form, but they're the same variables. Uh, our suspicion is B2 is negative, right? If things are higher than they should be, Y is higher than it should be, then it comes down. If it's lower than it should be, it comes up. If we wrote that second term as XT minus YT minus 1, right, then we would expect positive code, right? Because then it would be Y lower. Than it would so this is really, really straightforward. Really, really useful uh, when you have, uh, if you're dealing with integrated variables, particularly uh, non integrated variables, right? Now, the ECM is also useful for modeling station. <coughs> and it's really, really powerful, right? And the great thing is it doesn't make this assumption that effects have are, are short run, right? They also can have uh, long run effects, right? Uh, it doesn't assume persistence or decay. So this is really like Mark was saying. It's really, really general, right? It can incorporate, really explicitly incorporate uh, disequilibrium right into the model, right? And it can also deal with short term. So you may say, hey, I think it's short term that matters, okay? If you're, if you think it's short term, right? And you say, I don't need this model. All I need to do is yt change in y's and changes in x's, right? Well, okay. But why just to settle this by assumption? Why not estimate the damn thing, right? Estimate it, what do you find? Yeah, chops out at zero. Okay, fine. But you're right. Your assumption was right. Did you settle it theory? By theory? No. You settle it. You, 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 you had theory. Good. good theory. It's good to have theory. Theory very useful um, in modeling things and also interpreting things. But you know, this is something that could be settled empirically. Just go test it, just like we did with the ADL. Right. In fact, 
The great thing about the ECM, though the ADL actually and the ECM are mathematically equivalent. And what I have, I just want to show you here. This is how you can see the mathematical equivalent. Mark asked me to do this for you. So if you don't like this, blame Mark. Um, but I think it's useful for you to have in your toolkit, right? So you'll have. So you have this is what, what is this here? This is the ADL, right? Right? Y and lag y current x lag x, right? So how do we convert that into an ECM? Well you can take and subtract y, c minus one for both sides, right? About here, right? And now we can simplify simplify the left hand side, right? We're just making this a different spot, right? Okay. And what are we doing on the right hand side? We're combining these two y's, right? T minus ones. And so be beta one minus one, right? Exactly what we expect, right? If, if, what, if, what if this is one? There's no error correction, right? Okay. Moving on. Follow me so far? Pretty straightforward. Okay. So now what we're doing, we're going from, let me show you this. Okay, so now what we're doing is we're taking this xt here, and we're writing it out as the sum of its two components. xt equals the current change in xt plus the lag level of xt, right? It's what it was plus how it's changed. Okay, so that's all we're doing here is writing it out. This is critical, right? When you're trying to represent the error correction model, because you need to have this change in x, right? There's a, there's a component, right? Remember, they have the same coefficient here, right? Because they did up here, I guess. We're multiplying the beta 2 times the two components. Right? And then now we're combining these xp minus 1s into a common component. Right here. So it becomes beta 2 plus beta 3 xt minus 1. And then we just reassemble, right? Put the xt over here, change an xt, the difference in xt. Put this coefficient over here, right? Multiply times yt minus 1. And then we could want to embed this in here. How do we do that? It's the coefficient being beta 2 plus beta 3 divided by the coefficient here, you want minus 1, right? Simple algebra. And now we've just shown you how the ADL is exactly the same, you know, perfectly identical to, actually, mathematically identical to the, to the ECM. Now, does that mean that uh, it doesn't matter which one you use? Well, it if you're trying to actually, the ECM is really, really useful if you're trying to model this error, error, error correction component because it's explicitly modeled. It's right there inside those parentheses, right? That's really, really good thing. If it's not in the ADL, you have to back it up, right? Which makes it hard. Uh, so then why don't we use the ADL? Because, um, why, why do we, well, you know, so, so why do we always use the ACM? Because the ADL actually is a lot easier to work with. We just showed how easy it was to get those models. It's really hard, <laughs> except for the case of the difference model. It's much harder, much harder to see that for me to show you that in the case of the ECM. Uh, Mark has suggested I drop as much of these as possible, which is pretty much everything except the difference model. Okay. Um, here to simplify to actually work with the ECM, the best thing to do is just to, to write this out, simplify it, instead of having the error correction component to show. Uh, show how it would work out. It's actually easier to write it out like this. If you write out the V2, the V2 times the Y2 minus 1, the V2 times V3, the X2 minus 1. Now remember if the V2 here is 0, right, then what you end up with is you end up with a difference model. Very simple. And you can keep, you know, I can keep showing you how you can get these problems is that it gets really, really complicated. Um, there's a lot of work, a lot of patients on your part. I'm not going to ask you to deal with that right now. Um, I find the ADL really easy to work with. And so if I think the data are stationary, it doesn't hurt you to do an ADL. Mark might say, well, why don't you just start with an ECM? Well, you can easily just go to an ECM. Do both. It doesn't hurt you, right? So you can do both. If you do the ECM, you see right away what you need. And if you don't need it, just go to the ADL. Yep. And 
just a really, really useful. So you, the ADL and ECMs are general modeling strategies. The whole point of this is we all have to sell these by assumption. You get a little and empirically. If you want more on this, it's a really nice piece, pretty readable piece by Susanna DeBoeuf, who's now going by her uh, the name Lynn and Luke Keel uh, in the AJPS back uh, a few years ago. Smiling. Any questions on this? This is pretty straightforward. I need to just like, you know, to be sure that you're, you're following. It's very easy for me to walk you through. Yes, so, so, so that right. What typically are the like the major problems with the mutations? I had the feeling like I had this Bayesian model averaging that it works whenever you want it. So for this ECM, when? <coughs> so why? What is the argument not to use? Because it pretty much strikes me that we should start with that. I well, I, the ADL is really easy to work with. I mean, you get you get the, the they're both easy to run. I mean, so the point is that do both. I mean, there's no reason. It's not like this is not like one year you got to go submit run cards like you know Mark had to back when he was a graduate student. You know, you program, it took all day and you got to go you know got to go do it again. You just type in your computer, bam, bam, you do it, bam, bam, you do all the stuff, you do all of these right in like you know no time. And so, all I'm trying to say though is that when you're interpreting, do an ECM, right? If you if you want to, if you if you if, if you if you're not if you're not actually modeling non-stationary, if you don't have a non-stationary process model, then it's gonna it's gonna be easier to interpret using an ADL. That's all I'm saying. Um, so it's easier to spill out which form of the relation, what is the form of the relation, the, the, the relationship between X and Y. Is it different? Is it static? Is it, you know, is it like LBV? Is it ADL? Is it something else? It's gonna spill out. <coughs> And just do both. <coughs> ECM is more general because ECM will more explicitly take into account, more powerful, explicitly takes into account the this equilibrium between right in, right in the model itself. So there's this equilibrium right there, right? Uh, whereas that's not true in the ADL. It's in there, but you've got to back it up right? from the estimation. So I'm just, I'm just telling you what I think is what's going to be easier for you. I think if I walked in here and said run an ECM, you're going to run an ECM, and if it doesn't, if it doesn't give you a difference model, you're going to say, what the heck is the relationship between X and Y? Right? And he's going to, you run the idea, oh, there it is. Right? That's what I think. That's the, uh, trust me, I, 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 I Mark, Mark was like, you know, like, you know, they'll, you know, they'll burn you at the stake, probably, if you try to show them this stuff. It's really complicated. Translating the ECM representation back into those other forms. It's just really hard. And it's partly because you're forcing, just forcing this, this error this correction to run there. Um, I personally am really comfortable with the ECM. I mean, I think the error correction model is one of the neatest inventions. And, you know, just fantastic. I mean, it's a great, I, I'm in favor of powerful things that allow you to, to be really flexible. It's that what I get really worried about are things that constrain you. Right? When you start constraining, your options and it's bad. At the classic time series model is incredibly constrained. You know, it finds it, it can only take the form that it takes. And and then when it finds a relationship, you still don't know whether there is one. The relationship could have been entirely the result of two trends moving together. Um, and we see, still see people publishing. It's it's terrifying. Did that answer your question? Does anybody else have questions on this? This, this is uh, the last we're going to be spending on, on just just single time series. We should be here now. Do any of you work with like, single time series data? And it was very common compared to it's still common compared to quality research, but usually not in electoral research, and that's common in electoral research. It was very common in political economy research, right? Where most of the developments have been. The people actually working in there are people who started off kind of political economy and go back, right? To very political economy person. But this is not like a damn good. And I don't know. I don't do political economy. Oh, but you can still do. I mean, I don't do a lot of that anymore. But I still, I'm using more, actually, of, of this. Uh, you know, I, I do a lot of time series on public opinion, time series on elections, right, as well. Okay, well, if you do come across the stuff and you want more, just give it look me up. So what are we what are we going to now? Well now we're gonna go not quite it's beyond a single time series, but not a panel or not a time series cross section just yet. 
Um, what if you have a time series of cross sections? This is sort of, if you notice, know, this is not uncommon, right? This is something that came up in the discussion with uh, with the Marco sessions as well. It's when you have repeated cross section data, right? You don't have you don't have the same respondents, for instance, over time. Right? It's possible you don't have the same. Um, uh, well, there's a number of possibilities. This is start with you have you don't have real time series, and, and this is going to be not individuals. It's going to be oh, we're focusing here on on something in aggregate to begin with. Part of the reason is is uh, as you as you probably know, and we're going to end this session later today talking about binary cross section methods. We just don't have much real <coughs> panel data, let alone time series cross section data, right? We're working with individuals. What do we typically have? We have a poll today, right? Then we have a poll next week of the different people, right? Um, let's think about those. Here's the case. Polls of electoral preference during election campaigns. This is stuff. This is kind of like the bother us and I. I thought this is actually what we did is we actually found a way, we think we found a way to analyze the data, which is consistent with time shares and stuff and allow you to disentangle things. We started off, we did a piece on this a lot of ten years ago, we just doing this book, and we just we added and layered our, our understanding. So we're trying to find other ways to use these non-time serial data to infer time series um, processes. And it looked like, it kind of looked like panel data or time series cross-section data. We'll get into the distinction between those, but they're not really right. So just think about it. If you want, you can think about it in any country. That just, it doesn't matter which country or, or city or state for that matter. But I just think what we'd like you to do is just imagine that we have polls of electoral preferences um, and uh, over the course of a campaign. So in the United States, for instance, you might have polls you know, from, say, the beginning of the election year to election day, right? Okay. And we call that variable, it's called polls of two. Is that variable a time series? Well, it turns out that it's in some years, over some particular points in time, they are time series, but over the course of a full campaign like that, they're not. The reason is, for what did we talk about last time? Yesterday, we talked about how in order for there to be a time series, we have to have observations which are separate, right? And we have to have observations which are kind of equally spaced. Oh, we don't have that. Two, we have, one is we have, first off, we have a lot of missing data, and the missing data are not random, it's not random. A lot of missing data now, it's the daily data, and there's going to be a lot less missing data late, right, in October, November. And that's the problem, right, for a whole variety of reasons. But it's not going to be just, you know, that it, 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 historically, actually, it's really hard to go back in time and find data even monthly, let alone weekly. And if you're dealing with monthly data, if you can't even find monthly data, you can't even do a 12, you know, a 9 or 10 point time series now. <laughs> Which isn't much. In many years, we didn't know the candidates in the United States until June or July. So you might have a you know three month time series, a four month time series. You can't do much with that either, right? So it's not even time series. Um, even to the extent we have data, like you say, oh wow, you know, after September, you know, in September, October, you're going to have all these data, right? You're going to be great. You could do daily stuff. Well, the problem is they're not really independent readings on certain days. You're going to have a survey in the field. You're in the polling business, right? You're going to have a survey in the field on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, right? You're going to have a survey in the field on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Are those separate readings? No. They share two. They don't share the same respondents. You're interviewing separate people, you know, but doesn't mean they're separate readings. Why? Yeah, they overlap. Two thirds overlap. They're two thirds the same days, right? <coughs> it's a problem in modern time, right? We have polling, especially in the United States, and it's ridiculous how much polling we have. And private polling is even more ridiculous because there's so much money, right? It's really easy to do. Um, so it really limits what you can, and historically, it's really terrible, right? To go back in time, you have almost no, no basis for doing decent, uh, no decent, like doing decent time shares analysis. And so, so you have these you have these different election years. Like now, you have to go back and go back 15 years, polling data, 15 election years, and you know it's actually pretty good polling data for those 15 years. Before that, you have questionable you know, questionable polling technology. 
So and anyway, the point is that it's hard in most of these years, uh, and, and, and even in the years you can do it uh, throughout the whole year, to do any kind of serious modeling of, of poles at time t as a function of poles at time t minus 1, whether that's daily, weekly, or even monthly. So what can you do? Well, what we decided you can do, this is the first thing we decided, and this was a while ago, is you can actually think about the relationship, the, the relationship between polls and the votes over the course of these 15 elections. All right, so you imagine you have, you have polls uh, at different point time points of the campaign, and you have the vote at the, election, at the end of the campaign, and you have 15 of these elections, right? So at, say, time, you know, T minus 200, 200 days out, you have 15 elections, right, results, and you have 15 polls. Say time 150, I have 15 elections, results, and 15 polls. Time 100, I have 15 elections, 15 polls. And this is not the data box that Chris showed you right. yesterday. Right. This is a completely different way of slicing the data. Same data, but viewed in a completely different way. You know, each, each election is strung out through uh, you know, a large number of polls that occur across a lot of time. And for every election, you can talk about what happened on the 200th day before the election. And you have 15 observations. Well, maybe there wasn't the 200th day every time, but you can extrapolate to the 200th day every time. And, and you can interpolate to the, to the 200th day. You can interpolate to the 100th day. You can interpolate to the 125th day. Um, and you have 15 observations of each of those things. And that's where we are. And that's exactly what you anticipated perfectly. What we do is you could, we, we, we estimated we could come up with estimates of polls on every single day. You can say, how can you do that? Time series analysis, you can't interpolate, right? You can't interpolate polls that are missing because what's going to happen then you're going to be building in dependence. And so when you regress t on t minus 1, it's going to be artificially dependent. But we're not regressing t on t minus 1 in polls, right? We're regressing the vote on the poll, and interpolating just gives you more observations. Right? The assumption is that so, you know, if the polls are up here at day 150 and they're down here at day 200, that somehow they went from here to there. Now, maybe they're not going to go there in a straight line, but they went there somehow. Right? And so you've got this one, you've got this, this more fine grained uh, reading that allows you uh, analysis on every single day. For us, it allows us uh, analysis on every single day during the last 200 days, of the last 1500. And so the equation, right, is instead of the poll t on poll t minus 1, it's the vote in election j, right, on the poll at some fixed day t. So minus 200, then you do it again for minus 199, then you do it again for 198, 197, 196, 195, and so on. Now what we're interested in looking at is this coefficient here, the v, right, the coefficient on polls. And the R squared, right? The degree to which the model actually explains the variance in both. What if polls are a perfect predictor on a particular day or they're a perfect predictor of the vote? What would we find? Sorry? Yeah, the, the, the coefficient would be one, right? So poll, the poll and the intercept would be zero. The unit set would be zero, right? Because you'd say if you had 50 in the poll, what would you predict in the vote? 50. If you had 60 in the poll, what would you predict in the vote? 60. Okay. That's the first thing. Okay, what else if it's a perfect predictor? That's right. So what would the R squared do? Right, very good. Very good. This is you might say, why are you giving this example? It's funny, this is gonna be this is actually a very, very useful technology. Because you're going to find, in a lot of cases, you just don't have actual time series. And this is about the best. This is one of the things you can do if you do. And this again, is an absolutely actually, wonderful technology, but I've been trying to think of any application outside of election campaigns, and I haven't been able to think of one. I mean, it's great for election campaigns, better than anything that's been done for election campaigns. And election campaigns are really interesting, but it's not going to help us with your environment, as far as I can see. Well, the next, the next technology we develop, well, um, let's get to that in a moment. Um, that's a new technology. Um, okay, so here, um, but you just could be applied anywhere, right? In any level of analysis for that matter, too, right? So it's not, it's not, it's not, this is not U.S. specific, right? And it's not national, you know, presidential election specific either. 
Um, so what are we interested in observing? We're interested in observing the these. We're interested in observing the R squares as you go over the timeline of the campaign, right? How much? Okay. And what you're interested in is observing these patterns. Um, the patterns of these over time in the R squares. They tell you, you know, as the R squares go up, it tells you that effects are lasting, right? So if the R squares, I mean, one possibility is shocks come and they go, right? <coughs> what, if, what if campaign events have short um, are, are auto regressive, have auto regressive effects. They come and they go. What would you expect? What would you observe in the bees in the R squares? R squared is simple. Time. Election day, you know, minus 300 to the beginning of the election year. What kind of R squared would you, what kind of R squared would you expect? Okay, yeah, we're doing a regression for each day. We're day. doing a separate regression for each day. So we have an R squared for each day. What's going to happen to those R squares? Are they going to go up? Are they going to go down? Are they going to stay the same? Are they going to be constantly zero? Are they going to be constantly one? Now, now repeat the question. Pattern. <laughs> yeah, but what's the pattern if what? If, if it's stationary, if the effects of the campaign. What if, yeah, what, if, what if campaign effects last completely persistent? What do you expect to happen? They're going to grow. Yeah, they're going to grow. And how much? How are they going to grow? What's the pattern? I don't see that they will have a shape like this. Well, grow it, exponentially. That, is that for a, when they, if they last for a day? Okay. They last. They last if the shock variance is the same. It's important. If the variance of the shocks is the same, right? So you get a lot of shocks here, a lot or whatever. Little, that's going to look at this. Okay. If the shocks increase here, what are you going to get? You're going to get something like that, right? And if they increase again, <coughs> you know, it's all going to be the variance. It's the variance that then lasts, right? So it's the shocks and the persistence. That's what you're going to get. So something that looks kind of like that. It's going to go up in a fair or secular way. What if, it's, what if the effects don't last? Maybe low, 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 low. What's going to happen at the end? We know they're going to end up up here, right? What happens to the shocks at the end? What did you say about yeah, the evidence? Yeah, yeah. Okay. They, don't, they don't last until the election comes, right? Before they decay, right? If, you know, two days after the campaign, the election day, they're gone, whatever. But you get this from here. And it's going to depend on you know, the parameter, right? And it's also going to depend on the variance of the shocks as well. So you can get something that looks more exponential, or you can get something that looks more, more secular. Similar patterns with the datas. That's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do, this is something that I think has more general value outside of these elections, is you can look at the relationship between polls over different periods of time. So again, you're looking now at a poll, the poll, the, the polls of the um, over these 15 elections, but now you're actually trying to do some relationship between polls at two different points of time. Right? So here we're looking at the relationship in the poles as your dependent variable, right? On day, some day t. So you can say the week before the election, right? Regress over the last 15 election years. So it's a vector of 15 poll results. And you're regressing that, you're interested in this relationship to the polls in some previous days. So maybe say the week before, a month before, two weeks before, whatever. You, the key is you have to have independent data. These can't be interpolated data, right? So you can't be doing this interpolation. You're, now you're regressing them on each other, right? That's bad. It's not terrible that we don't do it. We don't recommend doing it. <coughs> but what you want to do is be regressing the poll on uh, the lag poll at different points in time. Whenever you have independent, well, at least separate reasons is the best way to think about it. They may be dependent, but they're, they're not dependent on the basis of measurement. So think about it as a week, on a weekly basis. So regress polls week one on week t, t minus one, week two on week uh, t, uh, t, uh, week three. Three, two minus three, two minus three, and two minus four, and you can get plots, right? You can get regressions as well. Well, do they change much over time? When do you find change in polls? If polls don't change much over time, right? There's gonna, you know, if you're a poll on one day, it's related to the poll on another day. How do we end up with the election results? 
it means that it's determinant from the very get-go. That's what happens. Well, it depends. Um, this is an interesting technology that I think um, that we find, we find, what we find is, a, is, is, is elements of real high-level stability in collection for electoral preferences and a, a areas of churning. This, this is when it reveals when you see changing preferences. You can tell, uh, when, do you find that, you know, when do you think you find a big churning in preferences in US presidential elections? Most of them have never thought about American presidential elections. That's sad. I know it is. It's so funny. I'm studying America. They're so fun to watch. Uh, I mean, the odds. Billion, multi billion dollar events, right? Um, I mean, most, it has consequences for all of us, right? That's the one thing. Um, so I assume most of you are interested, for that reason. But you find it during the convention season, during the summer, and you find it early on in the campaign, during the nomination process, when they're sorting out who the competition is. It's at least one candidate, sometimes two, right? Both candidates. And then also at the very end. But the biggest turning is really early. Uh, there's a lot of churning also at the conventions, but I mean, the, early, the early churning, like that's going on now, lasts a lot. A lot of that persists. The convention churning, a lot of the huge amounts of change, but most of it decays, most of it goes away. And at the end, there's less churning than during those two periods, but it lasts as well. But it doesn't make any difference really for the outcome. So it just matters how it affects how big the result is. Uh, unless, it's a, you know, unless it's close. If it's a coin flip, well, that, you know, everything matters, right? Um, okay. Another possibility, so we don't have real time series, right? And here we have time series, but not real panels. Um, what, what kind of case is this? So here we have polls of, uh, English is a little choppy here. Um, here, think about polls of voter preferences over a campaign, right? And you can consider the preferences of individuals in a particular year. Uh, in this case, you know, we have separate polls, right? So it's the same. We still have separate polls, right? So we have different individuals, right? So we're just looking at the one election year, right? Uh, and, you know, election election or parliamentary election, whatever. But, and, and so we're, we're, the respondents are changing, so we don't have real panels, right? This is very common, right? Very, very common circumstance. This data is really, really, it turns out really, really <coughs> powerful. There's one thing you can do. So we have repeated so What can do? Well, one solution is a, is a stat form of stacking. Stacking is used to describe a whole variety of different things that are used within, within the pseudo panel or even panel context. Mark Franklin is a practitioner of this, you know, and, and good at some, some of his work. Um, and here what you're doing is you're doing an analysis of, say, individual vote preferences, right? Uh, and, uh, and, a, and independent variables in time. And so what you want to think about is each, each of these individuals uh, are separate, right? And so you don't have actual, you, know, you can't actually assess whether or not you know, their preferences are changing. But what you can think about is them having a vector of coefficients, right? A vector, you know, a vector of variables on which you can uh, have coefficients, for which you can have coefficients, right? That predictive behavior. And that behavior, those effects can change over time. For instance, you might say, you might want to just put it in intuitive terms. What is the effect of age at the beginning of the campaign? What is the effect of age at the middle of the campaign? What's the effect at the end? And this will precisely tell you. What's the effect of party? Does it depend on time? Does it kick in late party identification? Or party propensities? Or effect of gender, or income, or education, whatever factors you think are important, these individual level factors you think are important. So it's not actually a panel analysis, right, of individuals and their change, right? But what you're doing is you're sort of mimicking it right? by stacking. And the great thing about it is you can include everything and the kitchen sink as well. Because you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of cases. If you just take the common variables, you think, I don't think that matters, put it in. Interact it with time. Got this big, you've got 10 surveys conducted on a monthly basis over the course of the presidential campaign site. You've got what, 10,000, 2,000 cases in each survey. You've got all these variables interactive with time, and out will come the pattern. It's really nice. Again, it's not quite time series cross section, right? Because these are not actual panels, these are not the same people. 
It's a useful strategy. It's not a perfect strategy, right? It's implicit matching, right? You know that, right? You're familiar with matching, I'm sure. This is implicit matching. It's not explicit matching, right? So we're not trying to match the people, but we're implicitly doing that. Uh, we cannot address directly address dynamics, right? You can't do an ADL or ACM, ECM. Why? Because you don't have a path, right? You don't have time series of individuals. So these are just some things you can do with data. I mean, there's this, there's this world of time series data, Atlanta time series lab, where you don't have a lot of the stuff you want. And then there's this, there's this time series, there's panel lab where you have some of what you want. And there's time series cross-section stuff, which has even less of what you want. And then there's this in-between land right here, where you can, you know, you can say, okay, well, you know, I, I, there's some things I can do. This is useful for what you do. This is a very, very useful technology. The fold is very, very useful, whether you do elections or not, right? The fold preference change is useful for what you do. The election stuff is useful to, for the most part, it's gonna matter if you're trying to get to a, a final outcome. You gotta, you gotta link it up to something, right? In order for the electoral stuff. Remember, the poll stuff spilled right out of the technology. All we did, Mark, in that case, is to substitute the polls, right, for, for uh, for the election dependent variable, and then we had to expand the the uh, the time um, the time period, right, to make sure we had separate observations and so we could actually do the analysis and pull it on the whole t minus one. Which typically, typically we do okay when we do when we do two week periods. We get most of those elections. When we do one week period, we we'll get a lot. We get most of. We do one. We get them all virtually. When you do two or three week, four week periods, um, and that's really really useful. Any questions on that? Yeah? I don't know. I think this is a good time to break. Yeah, it is a good time to break. We're going to come back, uh, um, come back and we're actually going to get into the time series cross section analysis. Yeah. And uh, see you in half an hour. Thanks. If you have any questions, come on up.